Good afternoon and welcome to the latest uh, BioExcel webinar. Um, today, Kath Brooksbank from Embolib EI is going to be talking about defining training requirements for biomolecular researchers with high computational needs. Um, I should let you know before we go any further that this webinar is being recorded and it'll be made available later online on YouTube and uh, on the BioExcel project website. So you should be aware that uh, uh, this is being recorded for, for use later on. Uh, my name is Adam Carter. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of BioExcel now, just um, two or three minutes, uh, and then I'll hand over to, to Kath, who will be presenting the rest of the webinar. Um, so BioExcel, if you're not aware of the project, which is a three-year project at the moment to establish a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. We're working kind of in three main areas. The first one is in core biomolecular software. So we have three pilot codes that we are working on. Uh, we're lucky to have the lead developers of, of several of these codes in the project itself. Um, Gromax, Haddock, CPMD. Uh, and so there's going to be actual improvements to these codes that come out even in the pilot stage of the project. Um, and uh, the next important aspect of the project is usability. So as well as improving the codes themselves, we recognize that we need to make these codes easier to use. And one of the ways, the, one of the important ways we plan to do this is through the use of workflow environments with data integration. Um, and there are various different platforms that we're looking at to do that. And the final important part of this project is uh, consultancy and training and uh, outreach to the users of the center. Um, so the webinars form part of this activity. Uh, and uh, we also have some interest groups that I'm going to say something very briefly about now. Um, so uh, these are the interest groups that are being run by the project. The idea behind these interest groups is that they allow groups of people with common interests to come together to, to learn from us and so that we can also learn from you um, and so that people with common interests can speak to each other. Um, in particular, Kath today is going to be talking about our training interest group that we're launching uh, and that will be for people who are uh, involved in training for computational biomolecular research and related activities. At the end of this webinar, we'll have a question and answer session. So this slide is just to point out to you that uh, the best way to answer questions is for you to use the questions tool in your control panel, which may look slightly different from the one I've got here. Um, but you will have a questions section. So if you type your question in there at the end of the webinar, um, I will invite the people who've submitted questions to, to speak if they have a microphone. Uh, otherwise, I can read out um, the question to Kath on their behalf. So today's presenter is Kath Brooksbank. Um, she's working at Emble EBI, where she has worked since uh, 2002. But before that, she uh, was an editor of scientific review journals, um, including Elsevier Trends journals, um, and she launched, uh, was involved in the launch of Nature of Use Cancer. Um, she uh, then went off to uh, Oxford and then Cambridge, where she completed her PhD in biochemistry uh, with Robin Irvin. And then she joined Emble EV EBI to develop the outreach program. Um, her responsibilities extended to user training in 2006, and she's now involved in several pan-European projects, uh, including the ones you see here, RI Train, Corbell, our project BioExcel and Enlight10. Um, and she is the co-chair of the Curriculum and Competence Task Force of the International Society of Computational Biology. So thank you very much, Kath, for presenting today. Um, I'm going to now uh, invite you to um, take control. So I will uh, give you control of the slides and um, you can take it from here. Okay, great stuff. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, so I've got my slides in full screen mode. Can uh, are they visible? Uh, you'll have to um, cho uh, choose to share the screen now. Okie doke. I've made you the presenter, but you still have to choose what you want to share. Okie doke. Show my screen. Okay, right. that's lovely. That's great. Can everybody see? Great. All right, well, uh, thanks very much, Adam. And um, before I continue with my, my talk, 
there's one other person who I, I really would like to thank. Um, she's done most of the work that I'm going to discuss today, and she would actually have been um, uh, presenting this webinar, but unfortunately she's not very well. So that's Vera Mats Matza, who is um, uh, my kind of main protagonist on, on the work that we're doing with, with BioXL. Thank you very, very much, Vera, for, for everything that you've put into this project so far. Um, so I just really wanted to whisk through the objectives for this webinar, the things that I'd, I'd like to cover. Um, I'm going to give you a very, very broad overview of BioXL and its goals, um, very much from the, the perspective of the, the life scientist, which is, is, is where I'm coming from. Um, you, I hope by the end of this webinar, will appreciate how to perform a simple training needs analysis as, as a, um, a, a precursor to developing a new training program. Um, you'll discover how you can provide input into BioXL's training program through the new interest group that we're launching today. And you'll have an opportunity to interact with others who have an interest in training um, for molecular life scientists. Um, obviously with a main focus on um, biomolecular modeling and simulation, which is, which is the focus of BioXL. But I mean, this area in particular touches on so many other areas and that we have many, many things in common with, with, with the computational biology training community in general. So our hope is that we'll be able to use this training interest group to learn from each other, to share our experiences and, and to make training and education in this field um, uh, more discoverable and more um, uh, uh, effective for all. Okay, uh, I seem to be having problems advancing my slides, bear with me. Okay, that's it. So before we really get going, um, I'd like to understand a little bit about um, uh, the audience that we have with us today. So we have a few polls throughout this presentation and this is the first one of them. Um, I'm going to ask Adam to activate the poll in a second. Um, here we go. So um, basically what we're trying to find out here is what your motivation for joining this webinar is. Um, we're really working at the interface here between uh, computation, biology and education and training. And so um, we're kind of used to working with people from a number of different fields and we'd just like to get a feel for um, what you view yourselves as. Uh, so uh, if you could just spend a couple of seconds completing the poll. and then um, we will move on. Okay, so all of you have voted now. And Shall I share the results, Kath? That would be great, actually, yes. Okay, so half of you are interested in learning about BioXL in general. Half of you are interested in learning about the interest group. Um, I'm delighted to see that you're interested in our approach to performing a training needs analysis. And actually, we've got everything there, everyone. So uh, there are no, no other um, desired outcomes. So I'm, I'm hoping that what I'm going to talk about is actually going to, uh, to meet your expectations here, which is um, rather gratifying. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a very, very quick introduction to BioXL, um, kind of from, from my perspective as, as, as a molecular life scientist. Um, so um, we're aware that the molecular life sciences are becoming increasingly dependent on large, computationally intensive experiments. Um, the, the, the research community as a whole is collecting vast amounts of data about living things at many different scales, from, from the uh, atomic level right the way up to entire organisms and populations of organisms. These data require huge amounts of storage uh, uh, on the one hand. Um, that presents uh, issues in terms of accessing the data sets and in terms of doing computational analyses on these data sets. Um, and uh, our tendency, our trend, is to want to use larger and larger data sets and to do more and more complex things with them. So whereas previously the, the domain, domain of, of, of uh, highly parallel computing was, was very much the domain of, 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 of the physical scientist, uh, life scientists are, are increasingly needing to use these 
and yet we feel rather under-equipped to do so. Um, and so, um, I mean, this is one of the, the issues that BioExcel is really here to address. Um, and nowhere is this more apparent than in the field of modeling and simulation, because essentially what we're doing here is devising very complex models that are often based on large data sets in, in the first place. And then we often want to, um, to, 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 to generate very, very complex models and to um, uh, do them over sometimes quite large time scales. Um, if, you, if you look at, at modeling and sim simulation in the grand scheme of things, some of the processes that take place in biology are actually rather slow compared with, with those that, 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 that take place, for example, in chemistry or, or I mean, if we think about um, uh, the kinds of the kinds of work that that, uh, that that they're doing in the Large Hadron Collider, where we're, we're, we're talking about completely different time scales here. So all of these things present um, problems for us. These are all problems that um, um, BioXL is attempting to to, to, contrib to contribute towards solving. Um, so basically, as, as as Adam has already mentioned. Um, BioXL is a pan-European collaborative project. Um, the initial project is three years in duration. We're aiming to make high-end computing more accessible to the biomolecular research community, um, partly by bringing together a number of widely used codes for modeling and simulation and improving those and working with our users uh, to, to, to um, ensure that um, they are uh, meeting our users' expectations. Um, we, we are um, uh, the, the, the Europe's e-infrastructure community is integrated into BioXL, so we have access to massively parallel computing. And around this, we're developing a set of services to meet the needs of this user community. Of course, today I'm going to focus on on how we're approaching the training aspects, but. Um, I'm also sort of slightly reaching into um, the consultancy work that we're doing and um, so we've been working with Adam and with other people um, in, in the consortium to put together this, 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 this set of um, interest groups and, and, and of course the, the one that's most directly relevant to the work we're doing is the training interest group that we're launching today. Um, and all of this is relevant to both academic and industrial audiences. And we've been bearing that in mind right from the very start of the project. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time um, focusing on, on how we're actually defining the training requirements for BioXL. And um, uh, before I do this, I'd like to launch our second poll. Um, I would like to learn a little bit about your professional background. I mean, I've mentioned already that this is an area where we have a real melting pot um, uh, really from many, many disciplines. And, and, and if I think about the institute that I work in, we have um, life scientists, we have physicists, we have computer scientists, we have chemical engineers, you name it. So it would be very, very interesting to get a feel for, for who we've got online and, and what you would um, define yourself as professionally. That's before we even think about um, those who are working at the interface of the science <laughs> and education and training. Um, so, so that brings a whole, a whole new dimension in. Okay, so I can see that 100% of you have voted now. Um, you are two thirds life sciences, a third computer science. 42% um, of you would regard yourselves as uh, learning and development professionals, and a quarter of you would define yourself as something else. So at the at the end of the presentation, we might go back and and, and, and take a look at that. Take a look at um, what you've what you've put in chat. Okay, um, right. So to thank you for that. To move on, um, this is just my summary of of how we're approaching training within BioExcel. And the thing I'd really like to get across here is when you're developing a new training program. It's very important to develop a really good understanding of your target audience and what it is that they need to get out of the training. But what are the things that they need to do and, 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 and where's the gap between what they can do now and what they would like to be able to do in the future? And I know this sounds really, really obvious, but most of the people who provide training at this level 
as scientists or software developers first and foremost. So training something that they do over and above their regular job, and I'm sure, I mean, just looking at the polls that you've already completed, I'm sure that that's the case for many of you. You're scientists or you're software engineers first and foremost, but you're also providing training for people who work in your domain. So often this is something that, that the people who are actually delivering the training don't, don't, don't have any kind of educational background in. Um, and so um, we've, been, we've been trying to tackle this within the training work package of, of, of BioXL and, and, and trying to put together a process that we can use sustainably as the center of excellence um, develops and evolves. And the way we do this, first of all, is, is, is by defining the competency requirements of our target audience. So what competencies are needed to exploit BioXL's offering? Um, we've thought about several different types of, of user of the services. Um, I'll go into these in a little bit more detail later, but basically we have entry-level users, experts, and then we have the people who are supporting all of that, the systems administrators and the application experts who are either developing the software or providing the, um, uh, the, the, the high-level compute. Once we've got that list of competencies in our hands, we can map those to training that already exists. Um, we have a very good network of high-performance computing centers throughout Europe, and um, many, if not all, of those are already providing training, for example. Um, there are uh, large data providers, such as the EBI and the other Elixir nodes, that are also providing training. And um, within BioXL, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to, we, we want to focus in on the things that are not being done already, where we can really, really make a difference. So that second phase is the mapping. Um, what <coughs> mapping of competencies to training, um, we then do a gap analysis. We, we, we look to see um, uh, where, where there are gaps in training, and, and we think about how we can fill <coughs> gaps. And then the final phase is to um, develop and deliver those courses that, that, that currently don't exist. And this is an iterative cycle, because, of course, once you've... Um, delivered one round of training, you've had a chance to interact with your audience, you, you, you realize that there might be things that you haven't got perfect the first time around, so you go around this cycle again. Um, and this is the, the, the <laughs> process, actually, that we, we've, we've, we've used in, in, in several projects now. We found it to, to work rather well, um, and, and so this is essentially the approach that we're taking within BioXL. Um, just to take a little step back, um, I, 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 I mean, I've had a, I've had a look at the, the list of registrants, so I know that some of you are already familiar with the concept of competency. But I, um, I, I always like to define this in my talks because it's not something that we expect everybody to know about. So when I use the term competency, what I mean is is an observable ability of of, of someone. Typically, um, in this case, a professional working in the biomolecular sciences. And, and this concept integrates several different components. So um, a competency is often made up of a set of, um, uh, of, of uh, a knowledge base, a set of skills, and a set of behaviors or values and attitudes. Um, we like to use competency as our kind of measure of, of, um, uh, of learning. Because its acquisition can be validated objectively, so you can you can actually um, find out from a trainee after the uh, after they've received a piece of training whether or not they have gained competency in a new area. Um, it's also something that's applicable <laughs> to learning of all types and at all different career stages. So people can carry this through their careers. Um, the way we use this um, in BioXL and, and in several other projects, which I'll, I'll touch on very briefly, is to develop a competency profile that defines these competency requirements for, for different types of, of professional or different types of user of a, surf, a service. Um, and, and typically, competency profiles are put together by professional bodies or learned societies um, in collaboration with employers working, working in um, with which they're, they're working in. So this is something that is, is, is usually done as a community effort and is done in an iterative way because, of course, the field moves on and, of course, education and training moves on as well. 
So just to give you an example of what a competency looks like, um, this is one that comes from the competency profile that we've developed in, in BioExcel. Um, so uh, we have write his or her own scripts to perform ta uh, tasks in the context of biomolecular research. Um, so that particular competency is broken down into a set of knowledge, skills and behaviours. Um, the knowledge required to meet that competency is knowledge of existing commands and libraries that need to be reused, um, and um, the ability to judge when a task should be automated. Um, so for example, sometimes it's not worth writing a script because it's actually quicker to do it manually. So having, having that judgment is part of this competency. The technical skills required, um, the ability to automate the process of executing a process remotely, the ability to write <coughs> Bug scripts, and then the behaviours. Um, in this case, we've selected the, the 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 use of appropriate scripting languages to do the job. So that just gives you a feel for for you know how we unpack one competency and what we actually mean when we when we say uh, when we use the term competency. Um, another dimension to this is is that you can you can have a competency at different at, at different levels, um, and um, typically. Um, and certainly in the projects that I've been involved in, we've, we've kind of used three levels of competency and we also um, categorically state when a competency is not required for a particular type of individual or a particular type of professional. So our scale goes from no competency required um, through a basic awareness um, to a working knowledge and then to a specialist knowledge. And when we get to this specialist knowledge point, um, uh, the, our, our, um, our, our understanding of this is, is, is a professional who is actively contributing to the advancement of, of, of an area. Um, so it's not just that they understand the field and, and can um, uh, uh, participate in, in, uh, in that area, but they are actually moving the field forward. <coughs> Um, obviously, these uh, levels of competency can um, progress as an individual moves through their career. And uh, one of the models that we like, a model that was um, developed by a collaborator of ours, Michelle Trachtenberg, um, is this kind of three-stage model where you start out as an apprentice, um, you have the prerequisite knowledge, but you haven't gained the experience of applying it. Um, you transition through to um, the, the, the journeyman phase where you have some experience, you're building on that experience. In the traditional sense of the, world, the word, a journeyman would then you know, travel, travel around gaining more experience by working with different professionals in his, his or her own field, which actually, if you think about it, is exactly what we do in a research setting. Um, and then finally, um, you get to the point of being a master, where you have sufficient mastery of your role, um, not only to be able to do everything yourself, but also to be able to coach an apprenticeman and get them to journeyman level. So this, again, is an iterative <coughs> cycle where the real experts in the field can then um, bring forward the less experienced people in their own field. So this is this this is a model that works nicely for us because it's it's it 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 it's it's basically the model that um, uh, uh, that uh, biomolecular research and and most other um, forms of research take. Um, there is a process to developing a competency profile file which I'd I'd, I'd like to to briefly share with you, um, and the thing I really want to um, make clear here. Is, is that we don't start out by assuming that we know what's needed. We, in fact, we start out assuming that we don't know what's needed and we survey. Um, we go out and ask people what the competency requirements are. In the case of BioExcel, um, we held a workshop where we invited um, different types of professional who are involved in biomolecular research and we spent a day and a half picking their brains in a, in a semi-structured way. Um, so we had employers, we had people who were using the, um, the different codes in BioExcel. Uh, we, we thought about who the users of, 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 of BioExcel <laughs> on, on those different levels and, and what um, 
they needed to be able to do, how they needed to interact with uh, our new centre of excellence. And, and we spent that one and a half days um, compiling a rudimentary list of competency requirements. Um, and, and actually within that day and a half, we defined those competencies, including the knowledge, skills and behaviours required um, for each competency. Um, we started to think at that stage about levels or phases for different roles. This is, this is something that I think will we'll continue to develop um, throughout uh, the, the project. At this point, um, we, um, we have something that we can send out for consultation. And in fact, later on in my presentation, um, there is, there's, a, there's a link to a publicly available version of our competency profile. Um, we'd really, really welcome your input um, to this. So please do, um, when, I, when I give you the URL, please do uh, go and take a look at it and, and provide us with, with feedback. So at this stage, you know, you start to think about what's missing, what needs to be fixed, what's inaccurate. Um, and, and also, you know, this gives people an opportunity to, to start using the profiles um, to, to develop training. And, and this is precisely the context in which, in which we're now using. Uh, the, the, the competency profile that we have. And um, uh, like anything that is going to remain viable over, um, we hope, a long period of time, this is going to need refinement as the field moves on. And so our plan here is that we, we will have regular updates and that our training will also move on um, in sync with those regular updates. So what we're providing is not something static that gets filed away somewhere. It's a living document that we can continue to use to develop um, training for uh, this new center of excellence. So um, I'm just going to briefly take you through the kinds of things we've got in the competency profile. And um, we, we started off putting these together um, in a rather um, uh, brainstorming manner, and then once we once we once we'd, we'd we'd got our initial list, we were able to start um, <coughs> siloing these these competencies into different types, um, and we came up with a set of um, generic competencies. These are the kinds of competencies that that anyone working in a research setting might need. Um, we have selected five. There are there are many more than five, but we've selected the five that we feel are, are most relevant and necessary within the context of BioExcel. Um, there's a set of scientific competencies, um, and then we have kind of two levels of computing competencies. There are the generic computing competencies, what you need to be able to um, uh, operate um, data resources, tools, uh, uh, analytical pipelines in, in a sort of typical uh, uh, scientific departmental setting. And then there's a set of additional parallel computing competencies that would take you up to, to the level of, of really, really being able to make use of, of, of um, uh, large, massively parallel computing facilities. Um, one thing that I would like to make clear here is that we didn't invent this all from scratch. We have um, aligned the competencies that we've put together um, with other similar initiatives. And, and I'll, I'll just mention a few of those um, in a few minutes time. Um, and I've mentioned already that we have different types of user. Um, and uh, this is a bit of a spectrum. I mean, yes, we can find examples of sort of classical entry level users, classical specialist users, but many people fall in between. And so uh, any individual might have a mixture of um, entry level requirements for some competencies, specialist requirements for, for others. Um, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong in using a competency profile that way. We, we recognize that it's, it's a simplification of reality, but it's a pragmatic tool that we can use to develop our training. So I mentioned that we have aligned this with, with, with several other international initiatives, and, and these are just listed here. Um, all of this competency-based work has basically stemmed from um, a, a kind of a grassroots movement called Life Train, which, which came out of, of one of the Innovative Medicines Initiative projects, which, is, which just finished in September, actually, a project called M-Train. 
um, which has been developing a framework for education and training throughout the biomedical sciences. Um, we've kind of road tested those concepts in several different contexts. The first one was working with the International Society for Computational Biology. Um, Adam mentioned that I co-chair the Curriculum and Competencies um, Task Force within the ISCB and we've put together uh, a competency profile for bioinformatics professionals. BioExcel used quite a lot of, uh, of the work that the ISCB has done in, in putting its own profile <coughs> together. Um, we have two projects that bring um, uh, groups of research infrastructures together. Our iTrain focuses on management and, and, and um, leadership training for research infrastructures, whereas Corbell focuses more on the technical training for the research infrastructures. There are actually many synergies between Corbell and BioExcel, and we'll be making the most of those. Um, the two projects are pretty much in sync, actually. Um, and then we've also done some work with Health Education England to look at um, bioinformatics requirements in a clinical setting. Uh, what do clinical practitioners need to know to make the most of um, data coming out of projects such as the 100,000 Genomes Project. Uh, so, th I mean, this is a very nice project actually because it, it, it takes this whole idea of um, uh, uh, um, using scientific competency into a, a, a very um, application-based setting. Um, these people are not doing research, they are um, using bioinformatics to make clinical decisions. Okay, so just to give you a, a, a sort of bird's eye view of the kinds of things we have in the BioExcel competency profile, this is all set out in, in, in the web-based document that I'll give you a link to, but I, I, I just wanted to throw some of these down so that you could you could get a feel because the, the, the document itself is quite large and it's, it, it's quite difficult to get it into a slide um, slide based setting. Um, and I mentioned that we, we really highlighted um, the generic competencies that we felt were, were most important um, for users of, of, of the BioExcel Center of Excellence. Um, so there's a, there's a set of um, ethical, legal and social, implications which would be it would actually be very very easy to forget about in in, in a project of this nature but um, we are, we're, we're, we're dealing with data here and some of those data might be sensitive and uh, um, so so this is something that we wanted to make sure we incorporated um, there are basic competencies such as team working competencies um, focus on your own professional development communication skills um, and particularly for the um, the, the group of um, systems administrators and, and uh, operators and service providers understanding user needs and being able to, uh, to, to tailor your service to the needs of those users um, is, is a very important generic competency. The scientific competencies, um, there are probably no surprises to, to any of you here, these focus around data-driven science, data management, being able to evaluate the computer-based system that you need to use for a particular type of experiment, uh, basic things like understanding the scientific process, being able to work with distributed data, um, uh, and of course expertise in um, both the formal and the natural sciences. Uh, all of this of course depends on how far you are down that spectrum between from, from, from uh, uh, formal and physical sciences through to natural sciences. Uh, understanding licensing policy as well, if you're, using, if you're using tools, if you're using codes from many different sources, you need to understand what the licensing implications are there. Uh, in terms of generic computing competencies, um, uh, there, again, there are probably no surprises here. Being able to install the relevant software, understanding your operating system, Good programming practice, being able to write and adapt programs, and being able to deploy and test non-commercial software, um, and again identifying and defining your your computing requirements. And then finally, when we when we get up to these uh, uh, larger scale experiments, um, it's things like understanding batch systems, performance profiling. Um, understanding the advantages and limitations um, in different types of environment, cloud versus grid, um, uh, parallel programming, so uh, 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting any of these to be surprises to you. We may well have missed some things, and if we have, if if if, if there are things that you you um, notice are missing, please do let us know. Because as I say, this is this is always going to be in progress. Um, so we've we've provided access to the competency profile. <laughs> Second URL here, um, we have also developed a competency survey um, where we've, we've basically asked um, our constituency to define what kind of user they think they are and tell us which of these competencies are most important to them. So we'd be very grateful if you could complete that survey. This is all part of our ongoing consultancy process. So what will all of this be used for? Um, well. Most importantly, it's going to be used to develop high-value training materials and also to adapt existing ones because, um, as you'll see later on, there is already actually quite a lot of training material there. And um, in particular, the, you know, the HPC centres have already developed a lot of training, but somehow it's just not quite accessible enough in, in all cases to the life science community. So we've been doing a lot of thinking about, about how do we... How do we um, adapt this material to make it um, uh, more discoverable and more accessible to, to life scientists who, who want to make use of, of large-scale compute? We're going to try and package this up um, in VM-based prepackaged bundles so that trainers and educators can use this so that they've got the software and the training materials that are required for particular types of training. Um, and uh, you know, BioXL is, is working on this um, for the, um, uh, the, the more research-oriented parts of, 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 of the project, so putting together workflows in, in pre-packaged bundles, for example, and we're adopting the same philosophy to how um, we want to deliver the training. Um, we're planning to incorporate the materials that we develop into workshops that are already being run. So major infrastructure events, such as those run by PRACE, EGI, Elixir and Instruct, um, major life science conferences, such as ECCB, <coughs> or ISMB, of course. Um, and then, um, you know, basically to work this into our existing collaborations with other major training activities. So, having said all of that, what kinds of training do we do we need to develop? Um, we've done a, 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 a big uh, search and map exercise here. Uh, so, we have gone out, we've asked our own constituency, we've gone out and done searches, we've looked at um, uh, registries of training resources that already exist, such as the on-course database, um, Elixir's training e-support portal, um, and we've, um, we've basically gathered together a set of 120, 173 training resources, some online and some face-to-face, -face, that already exist, that have relevance to the competencies that I've listed. Um, we have then mapped those training resources to individual competencies. And, um, and this is just a graphical overview of um, the mapping. And you can see, you know, for some of the competencies, there are rather a lot of training resources um, available, particularly for the, the scientific um, competencies that we've, we've, we've defined. Um, uh, but then, uh, you know, in some areas, there are, there are actually remarkably few um, training opportunities available. And so, I mean, basically, we decided that we would go for a sort of cutoff here, and, and um, we thought, well, if there are already um, five or more courses available, then we might want to look at these, but they're not going to be our high priorities. If there are fewer than five courses available throughout Europe in, in the, covering a particular competency area, then we're going to look at these in a lot of detail and think about how we can incorporate these into our own training program, because we'll then be and adding something completely new to the body of training that it, it, it exists for um, the biomolecular research community, and we will be directly meeting the needs of, of, of BioXL's users. Um, one thing I want to make uh, clear at, at, at this point is that um, actually um, what we've got in these graphs is really a, a rather falsely optimistic view because um, I showed you how a, an individual competency breaks down. 
and each competency has several different aspects to it. It has knowledge, it has skills, it has behaviours. Many of the courses that we found might address one part of a competency, but not the entire competency. And so whilst it, it kind of looks as though we've got quite good coverage, in reality, the coverage is not quite as, 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 as good as it would appear at first sight. So that's my kind of big caveat for this talk. <laughs> Um, there's, uh, there's, there is a, a range of both online and face-to-face, -face, which in fact is, is, is rather gratifying because, um, I mean, many of, many of you understand, you know, the, the, the complementarity between these two different training modalities. It's really, really lovely to be able to lock yourself away in a room with a group of other people who are interested in the same thing and, and to be able to pick the brains of real experts in the field face-to-face. But this kind of training is, 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 is not scalable and it's expensive to put on uh, um, and, and also it's, it's timely. So um, if, if we can also provide access to um, uh, on-demand online training, then, then you know, it, we're better able to meet the needs of, our, of all of our users. Um, so when we did our gap analysis, um, we basically binned uh, competencies into three different groups. Um, there's one group where there are insufficient training resources identified, but actually they're slightly outside of the, the BioXL scope and we're, we're not going to worry about them too much. Um, there is a set where um, BioXL or external training resources have been identified, so we think these areas are already quite well served. And then there's a third set where insufficient resources were identified by our gap analysis and, and we think these are high priority areas for, for BioXL to develop new training. Um, I have already uh, been through that slide so I'll skip over it. Um, and basically all I've done in these next few slides is to, um, to list those areas, um, those competencies where um, we have insufficient coverage. I'm conscious of the time, so I am not going to go through these in detail, but the slides are going to be made available on the BioXL website afterwards. So if you'd like to take a closer look at these and think about them in the context of, of your own training programs, then, then please do so. Um, but what I'm going to uh, focus on is uh, having synthesized all of the information <coughs> from that gap analysis, what we're actually going to do about it. Um, so I have mentioned that we've got three different um, types of user and for each of those types of user looking at the gaps um, we've decided upon our focus for the remainder of the project. For our entry level users we're going to focus on bridging the gap between life science and high performance or high throughput computing. So um, we're really aiming at users here who are transitioning from bench based uh, from a bench based molecular life science background to do more and more computationally intensive um, research. For our expert users, this is actually a really, really tricky group to meet the needs of because often um, they're already very, very familiar with with um, uh, particular types of molecular modeling or simulation software they might have needs that are extremely specific to their own use case. Um, and so um, whilst we may be able to provide some formal training courses for them, we're anticipating that these, these people will be very, very heavy users of our interest groups and that the interest groups that we've set up are going to inform the more formal um, training courses that we deliver. And then for the systems administrators and application experts, um, uh, we've got two main goals here. One is um, if we can enable better communication between this group and the users, particularly the entry level users, I think we'll be, we'll be helping um, both enormously. And then there is the technical training to, to stay up to speed in a field that is in fact moving very, very rapidly. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to do my final poll. I've talked to you a little bit about what our, 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 our three different user groups are, and I'd like to get a feel for um, which type of user you would consider yourself um, to be. And it may be that you don't really identify with any of these. If that's the case, then please do use the chat function to, to, to specify 
uh, an alternative group, what would you identify yourselves as? Okay, so I'm seeing that um, that's just flipped. We had a rather we have had a rather large proportion of entry level users, but um, actually it's leveling out a little bit now. So I'm going to give this two or three more seconds. And then I think we're going to, we'll close the poll. 83% of you have voted. Um, and here we go. 40% of you would identify yourselves as entry level users. And then we have a split between experts, um, systems administrators or application experts. And then we have some others as well. So we'll take a look at those others during the discussion session. So thank you for completing that. Uh, just to let you know um, what our plans are and also what we've done to date, um, I mentioned earlier that we, we started out our, our um, planning for the training program with uh, a workshop back in, in May this year um, where we essentially defined um, our competency requirements. Um, we um, have then run our first training workshop that took place in October um, in Barcelona and that was focused around workflow based training um, for computational bi biomolecular research. So we had, um, we had representatives from several uh, different workflow application tools um, there and working through um, use, use cases that were of special relevance to BioXL. Um, that went very well. Um, next workshop that we've got scheduled is, is a spring school that we're running jointly with, with, with PRACE um, and there'll be opportunities to, to uh, really get to grips with some of the um, uh, modelling and simulation software there and that the, the developers who are, are actually um, creating and maintaining that software will, will, will be available at that workshop. Um, we're going to be running, so that's that's kind of more aimed at the, the expert user. Um, from the th uh, 3rd to the 7th of July, we're going to be running a summer school, which is really aimed at the entry level user. Um, so it's foundation skills for HPC in computational biomolecular research. We'll be running that here at the EBI. And, and the basic purpose of this, this course is, is to get um, life scientists who feel that ill-equipped to use HPC up to the point where they can actually benefit from the training that the HPC centres are, are providing because many of them have found that they've, they, they've, they've gone along to some of these training courses and they've, they've found that there's a gap and they haven't been able to benefit as much as they would really, really like. So we're hoping that this school will, will plug the gap and, and that this will be something that we'll be able to run on, on a regular basis for entry level users. Um, uh, then um, we're going to be uh, doing another uh, school with um, with Prace in autumn, um, which which will basically uh, be the, the sort of follow on from that July course. Um, and then I'm, I'm anticipating, unless those courses are not well received, that we will be iterating those those two, um, and. Uh, by that point, we will have more feedback from the interest groups on what we really, really need to do for the for the expert users and for the sysadmins and application experts. Um, in terms of what we're going to be doing um, for uh, uh, on 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 the, the the webinar side, we've we've essentially got two aspects here. One is um, training for those user groups. And the other is the webinars that we're putting together for the training interest group. Um, here I've just listed the, the, the ones for our, our, our users. So um, we've got some webinars coming up on uh, how you make that decision basically. Can I, can I do my experiment using my local computer or do I need to go to a cloud-based system or do, it, do I need to go to something um, much, much bigger? Um, 
Uh, we've got um, something coming up on quality control of, of, um, of, of structures. So, you know, how do I decide in the public uh, structural resources what's a good model that I can then take forward for my, for my simulation? Um, uh, we have a series of, of um, webinars aimed at entry level users on the basics of biomolecular modeling, biomolecular dynamics. Um, we're going to, my apologies, I've just flipped my slides forward. <laughs> um, we're going to um, incorporate uh, all of these webinars into our e-learning offering. Um, and here again, we are, we're making the most of course material that we're providing face to face and adapting that to an e-learning environment. We'll work the webinars in. Um, we're going to be creating some bespoke online courses, and we're going to put all of this in a knowledge base that will be available from the BioExcel um, website. And we'll also link into other relevant um, repositories. So, for example, um, the knowledge base will feed into Elixir's training e support um, service. Um, much of what we're doing here is, 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 is thinking about workflows that um, our, our, our users um, uh, need to, um, uh, basically they, they come in with a problem and they, they need a, a, a workflow that will enable them to solve that problem. We've done a little bit of work at the EBI um, developing a, a sort of workflow based um, e-learning system that's, that sits on top of our e-learning portal and we've been thinking about whether it might be possible to do something like this in the context of BioExcel. Um, there's also a, a, a package-based tool within Elixir's training e-support system which we'll, we'll investigate as well so we, we may be able to set up training workflows within the Elixir training e-support um, system. Um, and, uh, um, and both of, of, of these plans are essentially uh, to make training for uh, biomolecular modeling and simulation more discoverable to the life science research community as a whole using resources that are already quite widely used and, and are already out there. Um, so obviously all of this will, will, will point back to, to BioExcel as well. Um, we're not trying to do this by ourselves. I've already mentioned um, many of the collaborations that are on this slide, so I, I won't go through them in any detail now. Um, but um, this is fully intended to be a collaborative effort that joins up with the many other excellent training initiatives that are out there. And I think this is why it's so important for us to have this training interest group, because it, it gives us a forum in which to bring all of these things together. Um, so what are the aims of this interest group? We want to improve the visibility of training initiatives and, and of individual courses and training resources that are relevant to, to biomolecular modeling and, and stimulation uh, and simulation rather. Um, so, so basically the members of this, uh, this interest group will act as liaisons with other training initiatives so, so that we can all make sure that we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, it's, it's aimed at facilitating collaboration between the projects promoting best practice, promoting efficient use of, of the resources that we have. Um, and um, we, we really want to use this as an opportunity to improve communication between um, you know, those who consider themselves to be more at the computational end and those who consider themselves to be more at the life science end because um, there is a real need to bring these two groups together now if we're going to meet the needs of modern molecular life science. Um, in the next few years it's just it's just not going to be possible to do your research anymore unless you are competent in making use of, 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 of high-end compute. And of course we want to promote the importance of high quality training. Uh, uh, not training as an aside to, to the research or the service that, service that you're offering but, but training as an integral part of um, of, of that whole. So basically it's, it's, it's there for you if you're responsible for or have an interest in training scientific or technical staff within your own institute or if you're a training professional in a field that's related to biomolecular research. Um, so we've got a number of webinars uh, already in the planning phase. Um, we have uh, some webinars on um, uh, 
engaging the hard to engage. So how do we encourage biomedical scientists who lack confidence in high-end computing to, um, to engage with this process? Um, and then we have a number of face-to-face -face events. Um, uh, we don't have uh, uh, fixed date for, dates for these yet, but I, I wanted to give you a kind of feel for when they're likely to be. So in, in February, we're going to be running a, a workshop on, on using containers and VMs in training. Um, uh, in July, we're hoping to be doing something at the ISMB ECCB conference um, uh, in Prague. Um, and then in December, we're hoping to be at the Lifelong Learning Conference um, at EMBL. Um, so this is a conference that started uh, in summer this year and, and, and we hope is going to become a regular part of the training calendar. So these are all opportunities for um, educators and trainers in biomolecular science to come together and um, exchange best practice and, and, and move our field forward. Okay, and so at this point, I am going to stop, and I'm going to I'm 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 going to uh, move us forward into the discussion part of of, of this webinar. Um, I, I would have liked to have given us longer for discussion. I'm afraid I've rambled on a little bit, but what I would really like to know is what other activities would you like to see in the training interest group, and what out of what you've seen, um, what what do you uh, what do you see yourselves participating in? Uh, so, um, just a quick reminder of how the Q&A session will work, um, and then I am going to hand back over to Adam to kind of administrate this, and I will answer the questions either as you speak or as Adam reads the questions out. Okay, yes, thank you very much indeed, Kath, for that, uh, that discussion today. That, that's really great. So, as Kath said, we're very happy to hear either questions or comments from you. Um, so, uh, if you do have a, a question or, or a suggestion as to something that the, uh, the interest group should be working on, then it would be great if you could type it into the, the question area now. Um, so, uh, while we wait for those to come in, I did have one question for you, Kath, just to get things um, started off. And that was about when you were uh, going out to consult with people, um, Presumably, you needed to speak to both the people who might be interested in training, but also other experts who might have a better idea of the of the gaps in people's knowledge. Is uh, how, how do you deal with the, those two different groups of people that you need to consult with? That's a really good question. And um, when we, I mean, when, when we when we put our initial workshop together. Um, the way we approached this was by making sure that we had both um, experts in codes present and um, users of those codes. And some of those users had been using the codes for quite some time, and and in fact, you know, presented their own use cases at um, the workshop. So. And um, you know, looking back on it, they are very much the people that we would we would define as our our expert users. Um, and 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 in fact, you know, they they are the ones who are pushing the developers to um, uh, to to, to uh, develop develop new functionalities in in the software. And, and and in many cases, they're actually developing things themselves that then that then get written into the code. But we also had a number of of um, entry-level users, um, both from academia and from from industry. Um, the tool that we used to sort of try and ensure that um, we were uh, we, we were getting sort of decent decent coverage of our potential training space was was to was 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 to de develop develop um, personas. So we had we had a, a group of people in the room who um, uh, were, were sort of coming coming at this from all angles. So, you know, there was one group who knew who their users were. There was another group who, who identified with that group because they were users. And so we then we, we then put together personas who, who kind of represented those those different um, types of, of stakeholder in BioExcel. Yeah. Now, um, you know, it's it, it, it's it's always impossible to say with any conviction that we've you know we've covered our entire user base. 
but um, but that's 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 the basic approach that we took. Yeah, and and the fact that we then throw it out to consultancy after that and try and publicise what we're doing as widely as possible gives gives a, the, the the community as a you know, the wider community an opportunity to um, to then uh, fill in anything that we've missed. Great, thank you. Um, I don't want to hog all the time with my questions, so I did have a question here from Alan. Um, Alan, if you have a microphone, um, you're welcome to just ask your question directly to Kath or make your comment if you if you'd like. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering about um, if people have thought much about reproducibility in the in the HBC and HTC space. It's it's not an easy thing to do. That's why I'm asking. Mm. Um, so it's not something that we've discussed at great length in the training context, but um, certainly when we when we when we start to to, to move into the, um, the, the the discussions about the the, the work that's that's being done on the codes and um, the, the the you know the, the, the user uh, requirements, then then yes, of course, reproducibility is is, is up there. So having uh, if I was if, if I was to build that into our competency profile, um, then I think it would be um, you know having an appreciation that there are reproducibility issues, and um, being able to um, being able to address those reproducibility issues would would be how I would tackle that. Um, but I'm, my my very poor understanding is, is 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 that I mean this is you know this is something that the entire field is 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 struggling with so it's kind of it's a bit of a moving target. Okay, Alan, does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just curious as well. Yeah, no, it's certainly, Kath, we should uh, make a note and make sure that that's uh, either in there or. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a very yeah. good suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions from the floor? The other comments that we had um, typed into the the question tool earlier on. Um, uh, we we can discuss later, Kath. But we're, it was just you, you were asking about the kind of people that we had here. Or mm -hmm. examples of we had. Uh, Somebody said, I'm a life scientist who's moving into the training field. Um, somebody who originally had a maths background, now doing economic modeling. Had somebody yeah. from Lattice QCD. Oh, is that somebody else uh, asking a question? No? No, not sure about that. Actually, it's just, it's just me. It's just me again. I was just going to make oh, a comment. Yeah. But, uh, Carry on, Alan. Yeah. I, I, saw, I saw that you said about using virtual machines. I mean, I'd probably recommend that you use containers over virtual machines, but you seem to have that covered uh, and because it's easier for people to collaborate on, on a container than it is yes. on, a vir on a virtual machine. Yes. And it, yes. to make future improvements as well. And you can always turn a container into a virtual machine. That's not a problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So I think, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think we're, again, very much at a, a, a transition point here. Um, I mean, certainly if, if I think about the, the training that we... Uh, the, 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 the way we've set up uh, the, the, the compute for our training here at the EBI is currently VM based um, but uh, containerization is definitely the way that this is going so um, I mean I think this is something that we we have to look very seriously into and, and, and you know for BioXL as a whole um, I mean I think you know, from, from my perspective this is one of the really really great things about being part of this this, this project because uh, what we're doing for the science is equally applicable um, in a training context and we can really really make use of that um, and, and that just you know that makes the, 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 the training resources so much more accessible. Okay. Um... Thanks for that. Uh, I don't see any other questions from the floor just now. Uh, Alan, do, can, do you have a follow-up? Please, please yeah, do. Can yeah. I one, more, one more thing. Sorry. Um, you, you mentioned that you were going to have a like a oh, an e-platform. I'm not sure exactly the word to use. I was curious what you were thinking on using. That's all. So, um, for, so we, we we basically want to put together a knowledge base of all of the all of the training that we have mapped to the competencies. 
and we want to uh, we want to make that mapping transparent so that if if there's a particular competency area that somebody uh, wants to improve in, they can instantly go and see what training is available. Um, in terms of what we will use to, I mean, it will be available from the BioXL website. Um, uh, so, um, we, what that, I mean, probably the back end for that will be, you know, classical MySQL database, <laughs> um, and it'll be a, it'll be a web-based interface. I, I, there isn't there isn't a specific, you know, we're not we're not we're not going down the the uh, learning content management system route for that. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's, probably, it's, probably it's an awful lot of work. That's why, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, again, you know, we want to we, we want to make that data set um, available to uh, other other resources that are, um, are making training more discoverable. So we need we need to think about um, how we how we pipe it to other sources as well. Okay, at that point, as we're now six minutes past the hour, so I think we should probably wrap up for today. But if anyone does have any further questions, or indeed if you're listening to the recording online and you'd like to uh, make a comment, um, uh, we will. You can carry on the discussions at our at our discussion forums. They are at ask.bioexcel.eu, and uh, you can uh, also um, you can find out more about the project at our website. So. Uh, on the webinar page, I'll also post uh, direct links to the things that um, that Kath mentioned in her talk. So if you do have the chance to, to contribute to uh, to the discussion about what should be in our training, then it would be great to hear from you. Okay, thank you all very much for joining us, and uh, we'll hope to see you again at a, a uh, webinar soon. And we would encourage you again to join the training interest group if, if it's of interest to you. Thanks very much to Kath and to all of you for coming along. Oh, thank you.